I have to say, this is a, a true honor for us to have two real change agents, I think, in electronic music period. Two people who've done a huge amount for this business through technology. Um, and it's taken a long time for us to get these guys to IMS, but I'm going to introduce to you the two founders of Native Instruments, being interviewed by Heiko from Groove Magazine. Um, thank you for joining us and take it away. Thank you. Ooh, thanks. Thank you. Um, to get an impression from you guys, um, I have a question. Can you please, uh, everyone, raise their hands who has ever used a Native Instruments product? Okay. And who of you has either produced music or DJed and has never used a Native Instruments product? Hmm. Okay. Um, <laughs> So um, we have a, a little video clip uh, lined up, and this shows um, a member of the Native Instruments staff. I think he's one of about 400 at the moment. And this was taken um, last week, so we get a little impression of this. What does it do? Uh, we have a pattern sequencer and an XY pad and a fader and a rotary controller, and it controls machine through some image processing wizardry and ground display for us. And be careful with the case. Um, so I assume this is not a new Native Instruments product yet. No, it's actually uh, a machine in the background and we are um, playing around with different type of controls, in this case Lego, and one of our developers um, basically was a hackathon uh, at the headquarter of Spotify um, and it was about basically doing sort of hacks of a certain, let's say, protocol to control uh, music uh, software and our developers used Machina for that and built different types of controllers for it. Just to understand, how were the Lego bricks connected to Machine? How did this work? It's just another access point to, to the sound of Machina. Obviously a hackathon, you are challenged to come up with something special that you program on the but day. But it worked with a camera that was filming the bricks and then... They were filming it, but obviously uh, the, the camera was not controlling the sound, but basically the position of the Legos, yes. uh, this was changing different types of parameters in the machine software. Okay, I think um, this is a good starting point also to talk a little bit about the history um, of Native Instruments. Um, Daniel, you started at the company, I think, in uh, 97, and you in 1999, so it was more than 15 years ago, and I assume that um, 15, 17 years ago, you couldn't make music like this. So um, 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 real-time audio processing was just in its infancy, and if you made electronic music, it was mostly still done with um, synthesizers by company like Yamaha, Roland, and, and Cork. And can you give a brief impression of your entry point into the company and um, how you made music back then, and what you couldn't do, what you can do now. I guess it was pretty obvious uh, for the founders of the company, uh, Stefan Schmidt and Volker Hinz, which I joined a year later. Uh, for all of us, it was obvious that the computer would be the center piece of production and later on also DJing. And the one element that was missing at the time, because sequencing was already happening in the computer, was the instruments. So the sound, the real-time synthesis didn't yet happen within the computer, which provides a lot of advantages. And we were just convinced that we could turn a computer into a musical instrument, and by that, get closer to the production and integrate better with the uh, whole composition part. And um, the company um, started out in Berlin, and um as you all know, I mean, back in the 90s, as a, 
has now Berlin has a very healthy uh, club culture and a big techno scene. How um, important did these surroundings and um, uh, did this, um, uh, well, what kind of role did this play for native instruments in the beginning and now? Um, I mean, it was definitely the reason that draw me to, <laughs> to the city, but I mean, by general, um, I think um, a company like Native Instruments was only really possible uh, at a place like Berlin back then. I mean, I think we were kind of one of the earliest startups in the, in the music space or in the, in the whole city in that kind of er era. Um, and for us, it was, it was very, very important to utilize um, the, the, the possibilities of modern technology, um, let's say, with a very forward-thinking artistic movement. And that was obviously coming from an electronic music background and doing electronic instruments. Uh, Berlin was uh, a perfect place because it was already this place which was pushing uh, the, the, the boundaries of el electronic music since quite some time, and uh, obviously with the club culture, but also then uh, drew people into the city that were very fascinated by this and were, wanted to participate in that. And that we could then bring in technology into the field of electronic music and the club scene, I think has opened also further gates for the city. And now it is a startup city with a lot of technology. Back then it wasn't, but I think that the, that the music uh, scene by general, the club scene and also companies like uh, ours, have helped to bring this interest into the city. Uh, I think that the, the, the whole music culture, the subculture of Berlin, um, was the root cause for all the hype that you've seen around Berlin in the last 10 years and also making it such an international place. Um, for the last 10 years or so, even a bit longer, you've had your main headquarters in Berlin in, in Kreuzberg and this has also around the same time developed into one of the main club and nightlife areas. Is it true that you sometimes still test your products at uh, like clubs like Watergate that are just around the Absolutely. corner? Absolutely. As, as a matter of fact, we consider the Watergate our house club uh, because it's just really down the road, three minutes uh, walk. We have a great relationship with them and we can just test out our stuff and just listen to it in a real environment uh, as it's supposed to be in the light life later. So especially the DJ products, this is really the environment that we test it in. There's um, two other very well-known companies dealing with um, electronic or with, with music startups in, in Berlin that were started a bit uh, later, um, Ableton and SoundCloud. Is there any exchange or, or so between these companies, uh, between the three of you? We will party with the SoundCloud guys later, so <laughs> I guess there is some exchange, but yeah, I mean... But funny enough, we run into each other mostly outside of Berlin. Uh, even though we have a dinner with the Ableton guys on Monday night, uh, but this is really an occasion that only happens every two years or so. Usually we meet at the NAB show in LA. So, yeah, we know each other, of course, we hang out to some degree, but it's not the most, let's say, not the closest exchange, because there is also some competition going on, and obviously everyone has its own focus. We are all very busy traveling in the world, so, yeah, as I said, usually we meet at places outside of Berlin. Um, one of the biggest changes in the last 15 years and also uh, within uh, the product group that you have dealt with is that at the beginning it was all, I mean the focus was at the computer and that you could create the music with the computer, but um, over the last couple of years we've seen a movement where the music is technically still made in the computer, but you, where you don't have to look at the screen all the time and where certain things move away from the computer. Can you um, describe the reason for this change? And yeah, yeah, funny enough, in the first years, it was all about to get into the computer because it was just the ultimate powerhouse at the time, and we just want to take advantage of this amazing uh, processing power that would grow exponentially every year. So for us, it was pretty obvious. This is the place where music has to happen in the computer. But um, years later, you know, when we had established the computer as a musical instrument, it was pretty obvious to us that the access to these instruments is very limited via uh, you know, regular MIDI keyboards. MIDI as a protocol itself uh, is pretty outdated. So it was all about how can we access 
the computer, the powerhouse, but actually don't draw too much attention to the screen, but rather where the action is happening. So where your fingers are when you do music, there should also be the displays, etc. cetera. So um, we really try to find A, an access point to the computer with controllers that we created ourselves, and then with display technology to even get the computer more out of the way. And I think this is a trend that we're gonna see uh, continuing in the next years. But um, this also means that um, Native Instruments turned from a software company also into a hardware company. That must have been like a major challenge. Yeah, it was. <laughs> and it still is because we are trying to um, also push the boundaries by now on the hardware side. I think uh, latest with the release of Machine Studio last year, um, I think the perception also of us has changed uh, quite a bit because we are capable by now to really release such type of hardware um, and not just some controller <laughs> uh, for software. Um, and we take this very serious and we are obviously very ambitious about it and, and fascinated by the possibilities. But um, being very honest, I think uh, the two of us, uh, we were the drivers of Tractor already very early in the company. And uh, we were fascinated by the possibilities of digital and um, what we can do with it. Uh, and obviously there was this whole uh, MP3 movement starting. We had all the files on our computers, so we wanted to do it. But we realized quite early, ah, we need to control this. And uh, we had drafts for our first controllers uh, very early in the days, but we were not able to execute this. So we had to wait. <laughs> for like six years. We had the idea early on, but it really took us six years to get to a stage where our hardware development capabilities would be at a level where we could create the product that we really felt is right to access the software. So um, We even had to do, sorry to interrupt you, we even had to do um, a different type of hardware before to, you know, to learn our steps in hardware development to not do kind of the most complex thing in the first place but it has helped greatly to basically then come up with this product that then turned into the success like the S4 and these type of products. And another recent move is also with uh, Tractor, which is your DJ uh, product, um, that this became available on iOS. And um, I also think you just announced um, an iPad version for Machina, uh, or for iMachina. And um, is this another separate important platform for you or? Yeah, you know, um, there is no doubt that uh, in the future, there, I believe there won't be a difference between a regular Macintosh and an iPad. It's all gonna be the same uh, operating system. And obviously touch devices become more and more important. And we wanna be where our customers are. We wanna create product that fits the uh, use case. And uh, so we felt the iPad is an amazing invention. Uh, we were fascinated by it, and so we felt, okay, what should a DJ product look like um, on a touch interface? And what we saw in the market did not satisfy us, and uh, so we created Tractor DJ, and it's important to us because it's just another environment uh, that suits maybe you know the after-hour gig or you know it's highly portable uh, so for smaller venues and we just want to be there and um, take advantage of this amazing device and it was really also a, a big project of passion in the company um, I mean it was it was pretty it was crazy a very personal <laughs> project actually <laughs> the two of us <laughs> we were with our team involved pretty much in every kind of pixel detail. It was uh, pretty nuts, but we were just so excited about it. Um, and we also see today, uh, I mean, we have a lot of people who are really excited about it, but obviously there is also some concerns regarding, hey, the iPad, will this ever be something uh, uh, like a real DJ tool, etc.? So, and what's the answer? Well, to me, it feels a little bit like the early days of Tractor, where we were, um, we had to invest a lot of time and patience <laughs> to uh, believe that it will actually become uh, significant and relevant and it took us quite some time so um, I think with the whole let's say touch technology and also let's say more uh, portable devices we see a similar issue and um, I, I think from our perspective it isn't really a problem because we are trying to do a more streamlined DJ experience on the iPad but it's definitely not for everybody right now. And uh, Marta, before um, you started at Native Instruments, you were a DJ and producer, you had your own record label. And I think you once said about the time 
just before you joined Native Instruments that you said that for you it got to a point when the music developed a lot, but that the tools to make that music remained the same. And today I have the impression sometimes that it's almost the other way around, that you have so many new music products um, all the time, but um, the, the music, music is still the same. Yeah. <laughs> Why is that? Um, yeah, um, it's true, but I would say it's not because of the tools. I think there's just, um, it, it takes some time for people to really utilize uh, also the potential of technology and then also maybe find a way to turn it into something really exciting and different. Um, and there I must say from my personal perspective, I find um, I'm not a biggest EDM fan or guy, but I must say that uh, um, people like Skrillex, for example, they have utilized digital technology in a very uh, massive way. And I think they're utilizing our tools or also Ableton and tools like this in a, a very, um, you, they're utilizing the power of it. The whole sound of that music wouldn't be possible without the digital tools before. So you have that revival of a lot of Chicago House and all of this kind of stuff, but in parallel you also have the sound that is really very, very, uh, uh, it is, wouldn't be possible without it before. And I mean, even a record like the last Daft Punk, it sounds very organic and very musical and everything, but this is a record that is completely digitalized. It wouldn't be possible without the digital world. So you see it everywhere, you just maybe not hear it all the time. Do, do you know what um, NI product stuff Punk have used for that record? Or for, which, have, for the for, uh, Daft mm -hmm. Punk? Mm -hmm. No, I wouldn't know. For the Daft Punk, me either, but obviously you said Massive earlier, Skrillex, you know, the whole sound of the dubstep movement uh, or synthesizer massive is really the, the bass sound that you hear is very much defined by, by these products. So as a matter of fact, we, we ha don't create products with a specific music genre in mind, but with just trying to push the boundaries of sound and then we leave it up to the musicians to pick it up. And in this case, Skrillex and alike picked it up and created something new. If you like it or not, uh, for sure, it's a, it's a great new sound that uh, such tools allow. So you're saying that if you create, for example, a new uh, synthesizer or a library of sound, you don't have a certain style of music in mind for that? No, it's, it's even more extreme. Let's go back to 1996 when a Native Instrument started. We created the software, uh, modular software synthesizer called Generator. That is the foundation of the company until today, if you want, you know, it's the roots. But the people that programmed it, none of them heard, listened to electronic music. Literally, zero. What did they listen to? I was the first guy that was really all, and then I brought in Marta two years later, that were all about electronic music. But the truth is, it was the electronic musicians that picked up the product first. So even though the, the developers were coming from jazz, rock, you know, different genres and had really different sounds in mind. It was all about the musical instrument and it's, it's like a guitar, you know, you can really turn an electric guitar into, you can use it in any genre you like and that is the philosophy of Native Instruments. So even though Marta and I, you know, we are definitely kids of the techno era and, you know, this is where we grew up on the dance floors, but to us, we never wanted Native Instruments to be for just a specific genre, but be there for the music in general. And then let's see who's gonna pick it up and do something ex amazing with it or not. I think it's important that, you know, we wanna push the sound forward and we wanna help to create new musical genres, but we don't, don't wanna dictate what type of music you do with it. And um, as also the other founders of the company, they may have an interest in jazz, but what unites us is an interest in the future of sound, and this is what we are there for, and this is what we are working on. So everybody has their own influences coming from somewhere, but our mission is basically to create the future of sound, but not the future of music yet. Is there any one native instrument product that the two of you use in private when you get home? For regular use, we don't have time anyway, mm -hmm. I guess, even Mata, but I'm not a producer myself, nor a real DJ, but I play the guitar a little bit, so I got guitar rig, and I use Tractor when I celebrate my birthday, but that's about it. I gotta admit, for, for me, it was always more to try to enable the people that are able to create these uh, instruments and, and products and to help them 
get it out, and I didn't look at it from a user perspective that much because uh, my own life is not dominated by a studio environment. And you, Marta? Um, tractor and machine. Um, on, if I would have to pick something on a regular level, it would be this. Um, I think more regularly tractor because, you know, I come from the DJ thing and it's just playing around with stuff. And then machine actually was the product which I was very involved with, uh, with in the beginning because this was a time when, when I was still doing even more music than today and uh, privately and it was coming out of a lot of frustration that I was feeling back then uh, with some of uh, uh, the people uh, uh, we worked together so and that I'm following more closer with but to be honest it really depends on some products for example we just recently we did molecular which is a new type of effect processor uh, and I was very very interested in that um, and so it depends which type of product it is. We're working right now on a new synthesizer. I'm not using it yet, but I'm always going by the office of the guys who are working on it and trying to see what kind of new sounds they get out of it. So for certain types of things, I still have a lot of passion, but being very honest, we don't have that much time to really uh, uh, kind of do this regularly on the side. And I mean, uh, Native Instruments products over the years have been some of the biggest drivers in the democratization of um, music. And I, as a music editor for a magazine, I experience this myself every day. I get tons of music, and none of it sounds really terrible any longer. Sound-wise, it's all pretty okay, but it's also really boring. So um, d d do you feel just a little bit guilty? Because Not it's so much easier to sound mediocre? <laughs> no, you know, I, I, just, I, I just spoke recently on a panel and, and I was asked a similar question and I said, uh, you know, there's all this music out there and there's all these tools out there, but there is still one ingredient that you need to create great music and that's talent. And this is nothing that we can provide, so we just provide the environment. And I really think there is a ton of amazing stuff uh, in the music world but there's just so much more than there used to be because everyone can do something, but that doesn't mean that so much more great stuff is happening. It's just, you know, I guess there's probably more great music than there used to be because of more talented people, but even more stuff that is maybe not the greatest uh, shit that would have never gotten released in the old world. Yeah, I think it's really, um, for us it's more important that there is an opportunity now for more and more people to actually be creative. And so I don't think that we feel guilty about the stuff that these people produce, but actually that we are empowering people to, uh, no matter where they come from, what education they have or where they start, but that they are able to afford it and to kind of get into it and just kind of see where it takes them. I think this is a significant change to the way how it used to be uh, before computers, and I think this has r really liberated a lot of people. And also a platform like SoundCloud, being able to just put your stuff out there and then suddenly people finding it or through social networks and whatnot, and really you, you feel an interest by people and you, it pumps you, you are excited. I think there is much more that was gained here than obviously the issues that I can totally see from your perspective. And I have the same issue because it takes me much more time to find interesting music, but I hope that the, uh, um, the whole technology field will master this like issue as it's well. It's just so much harder to find the stuff. It's there, and I think there is more than used to be, but it's hard to find it. And one job that, that companies like Spotify uh, and others, and by the way, also uh, uh, we ourselves working on this, um, to find the sounds that you actually want, you know, and the music that you actually want to listen to. This is, is a challenge, but uh, there are solutions and people work on it. And uh, speaking of, of which, you've mentioned Skrillex before, but uh, for the two of you personally, have you um, discovered any exciting stuff recently where you thought, okay, wow, uh, this guy made something with our products um, that I feel is very innovative or that, uh, that really speaks to me? To be honest, I don't judge music by innovation. It either resonates or not, so I couldn't, you know, the term innovative is maybe not the term that I use to describe what's great music to me, so, which is completely different when it comes to the tools, because they should be really uh, game-changing. They should allow to do different stuff, but when it comes to music, you know, it's just very emotional, and 
No, I wouldn't know one specific record that I could mention in that regard. You, Mata? Probably, uh, come on. Uh, I'm definitely digging through a lot of stuff and um, obviously... Sitting the, for hours on the airplane, <laughs> just doing like that. And the good so. thing is really being friends, you know, when you discover something, you can share it. It's like, so when he finds something new, uh, he sends it to me, or if I find something new, I send it to him. So I think this whole way of utilizing your friends or your sh social network to find music is a really uh, good way to digging through the masses of music. But I've found myself um, judging music also from different perspectives uh, these days. For example, Skrillex is one example. Another example that I was very fascinated with was the record by Kanye West last year, which I was finding a pretty amazing statement or let's say a challenge to see how far pop has gone by now and see, will this work? Are we really at a point now that something like this is being considered pop? Because if it is, then I'm really like, yeah, fuck. It was worth it all the time that we invested into it, that this is now the music of, of, of the kids or whatever. It's really great. And the same is kind of for Skrillex. It may not be the music that I'm personally the most excited with, but knowing that 14, 15 years old kids are getting freaky about this kind of stuff right now gives me some optimism about the future. So privately, I'm listening to a lot of, let's say, weird electronica again these days. So I'm a big fan of 10 Tricks Point Never that just recently released on Warp Records, but also his older stuff. And I'm a big fan of Tim Hacker and these kind of people. So I, I'm really up for this music that has a lot of space and is without beats even, and just really very organic types of modulation of sound. Do you like any of the music that's made by people um, in your office? What? Are you, do, do you like any of the music that's made by people who are working for Native Instruments? Yeah, some of our guys. <laughs> Should I not mention names or what? We have one guy who's amazing uh, uh, a DSP developer um, and a musician as well. His name is Object. He's doing bassy techno music and he was working with us um, on one of the big features for the Machine 2 release, the drum synthesizers. So yeah, we have some of those guys. What for you are the biggest area of growth for the company? Is it uh, mostly by um, developing new products or is there also um, are there certain markets uh, that you can see develop more than, than others? Um, how do you see the company grow in the future? As a matter of fact, there is really diverse opportunities uh, for us. One is we really want to make sure that we, the music producer and the DJ, that both of them, from an entry level to the top tier, are well served and that the whole environment that they use to perform or to create music is just kick ass and then everything is seamlessly integrating so there is some potential to just add the missing components um, and that's an area where we're working on the other thing is to just go wider to you know right now we are most of our gear except for maybe i machine and tractor dj is definitely um, targeting the rather pro uh, guy and with these entry-level products there is more opportunity to go a lot wider and for us both areas are incredibly important so it's not the one or the other but we definitely want to make sure that the tier the pro guys are really happy with the environment that we provide from a hardware and software perspective and at the same time that we can widen the space and by the way just to give you an example I machine we did recently a survey how many people that get into music by dealing with iMachine actually upgraded at some point to machine and there was a pretty high number of people that through iMachine, through an iPhone, really got into creating music and then were interested to learn more, okay, how, how is the pro, pros doing the music and then got into machine. So that is, is really a path that we see and we really want to complement it from the bottom to the top, uh, from the entry level to the pro. Where do you see the company in, in like 10 years? Is it that on the one hand you're going for just a bigger market and use more entry-level products, or...? <laughs> 10 years is really a difficult question. I mean, in 10 years, I mean, ch things change so fast, and right now if you look at Apple possibly acquiring Beats, uh, possibly SoundCloud is going to be acquired by Twitter, or at least these parties are interested, and 
um, you know, five years back or ten years back, Warner was a was a when you were thinking of music, you were, would think of Universal and Warner. Now you think of Spotify and SoundCloud. So so much is happening, and technology is becoming more and more important. And then there's this very important element where I believe is is the future that creation and consumption of music is going to get a lot closer. So right now, there would be someone here that doesn't produce or perform music, just listens to it, and another person would create or perform music. You will find a large overlap, and these people do get a lot, lot closer. You know, in the, in the past, that was two completely different crowds, and that through the internet, through cloud technology, through the virtualization and digitalization of music creation, performance, and consumption, this is all going to come together. So. Where is Native Instruments going to be in that master uh, plan of the music industry? I don't know, but I hope that we're going to play a very important role and can just help with uh, this game-changing experience to get more people into music, uh, maybe starting as a consumer, but then uh, uh, get to the creation process too. I think what I would like to add to this is um, maybe it's more for the short to midterm and not so much for the 10 years uh, perspective, but uh, there's still some way to go, is that uh, we want to break down the barriers between, let's say, am I a producer, am I a DJ, am I somewhere in between, am I a pro, am I a semi-pro and whatnot, that we want to blur the lines more and to actually empower people to be as creative as much as they want to be with the tools, but don't uh, define themselves by uh, the definition of, uh, hey, I'm an instrumentalist, I'm a producer, or I'm a DJ, uh, but maybe create a new hybrid <laughs> through the tools that we're creating to basically bring these elements closer together. Um, and just before I went to uh, bed yesterday, I uh, switched on the television, um, and I saw an interview with uh, Daniel Erk, the CEO of Spotify on Bloomberg TV, and he was asked, he got asked, where does he see the future of the company? And he said, on the one hand, he wants to provide the soundtrack of people's lives, but his personal ambition was also to make um, people change the way that music is uh, produced. So it's almost the same answer, but coming from a completely um, other perspective. And this is exactly right, and that's so interesting, because honestly, again, five years back, Universal and we need, didn't need to talk to each other. You know, we would have different customers and it would be different worlds. You know, the only thing that united us was the idea of music. But the truth is, everyone goes at the same place and it's a very highly integrated place and a highly consolidated place. If we like it or not, I think from a pure possibility perspective, it's an amazing trend. So I love that, that a person that is a consumer of music today can be a creator tomorrow, and that maybe even on the same platform. So I think there is a big opportunity there. From a pure market perspective, you know, you may like or not like the consolidation process that goes uh, hand in hand with that, I guess. And, and do, you, do you see the very big players? I mean, people like uh, Google, uh, Spotify, or I mean, Apple are in the music production market too, but maybe even stronger. Um, do you see them either wanting to buy you or wanting to move strong, more strongly into the same market? You want to answer this? <laughs> I don't think for us it's about being bought. I mean, we haven't been bought by now, <laughs> because um, we like what we do. I think what we are interested in is change the world. And uh, whatever helps us to change the world, we will be interested in. And so for us, and this is really, I think, what Daniel emphasized on, music, and not just music production, has finally become digital and really has become more technical. Technology <laughs> is the driver here. And now, once you have the music creation and the music consumption place already um, in the digital world, a lot of creative possibilities are opening up, which I think, again, will change the way how music is being produced, but also is being consumed. I mean, just look at a place like uh, Ibiza and all the uh, uh, club gigs that you have here, or even, you know, crazy Las Vegas, where you have now DJs almost being like superstars, but kind of people looking at the DJ. I imagine an, a, a world where the audience is much more connected again with the people who are actually performing through technology so that there is a much more interactive dialogue, be it in the world online or be it at the location. And I think all these things are now opening up because finally the music industry is reaching really into the digital age 
and us already being there, uh, I mean, we are very excited to expand our horizon and change the way how me people are experiencing music in whatever way. Um, we're almost done here. As a final question, I wanted to ask you, in recent years, um, in different parts of the world, you've, at, at conferences, you've held the Truck Door Cookery School, where DJs and producers were competing against each other by cooking meals. Do you, does any, do it's you, actually not a competition. Okay. There's but no this, is, this is the, exactly the opposite. Okay, but, but, but the question first. was, do you have a favorite um, DJ chef? I think I really loved uh, Hector Romero did this, if I recall correctly, he did this amazing barbecue. Um, so his, his, his little barbecue of um, ribs, I guess it was, uh, that was amazing. But uh, the truth is the Tractor Cookery School, we just love it for being such a casual format um, of, of events, so it's not competitive. People just go there and mix something together that is just not music in this case, but actually food for other DJs that appreciate that. We just think it's a great way to interact within the industry in a not hyper, hyper conference, whatever environment. Um, okay, so I'm going to open this up. I'm sure there will be a couple of uh, questions from the audience. Uh, maybe here first. Hey guys, Josh from Chicago, how you doing? Hi. Hey, um, I don't know how much you can talk about future plans and products, but um, I'm curious if you guys have anything in the pipeline as far as, um, I'm sure you're familiar with like Universal Audio and their products. I'm wondering if you have anything along those lines where maybe it'll take away from your computer being taxed so much with your products, because I love Contact and I love Monarch now and all these things you have, but I mean, they're, you guys have some of the most I mean, they take up a lot of resources on your computer, a lot, of, you know, I mean, especially, I run a couple instances of contact and things start to slow down. So I'm wondering if there's any future plans with Thunderbolt, these new technologies, maybe to somehow take off the processing from your computer with your products. To be honest, that was a question uh, for us since our existence. Uh, you know, would we really add now hardware processing power? But we just believe in the exponential growth of power, uh, of processing power with native devices such as a computer or an iPhone. So the truth is no, uh, we're not working on that technology, but rather wait for the processing power to be as great so that you can get everything that you want without having to buy any additional um, processing board. Sorry, it seems like the products kind of utilize the most of the computer as the computers get stronger, so you're never really caught up, you know what I mean? There's something truth about that. <laughs> you have to limit yourself at some point. <laughs> also, oh, that's good, good. Really so it's great that the Universal Audio guys resolved that issue for us, and we are happy to, you know, to leave them a chunk of the market. Right, uh, also, is there any plans to maybe do something with your synthesizers and some sort of controller or hybrid analog software plug-in type deal or anything like that? Let me just say yes, but I cannot be more specific. But yes, absolutely. Uh, there is so much room both on a, on a software and hardware level and also bringing the um, synthesis technology together with sampling in a, in a more diverse way. So yes, uh, there's going to come a lot more and even this year. Um, the next question is over here. Hi, yeah, Paul Nolan from Paul Nolan Sound. Um, I just wanted to ask a question about machine. Uh, it seems that with machine 2.0, you are going in a much more DAW type direction. Uh, I know you Congratulations can't... for finding that out. Oh, thank you very much. It's, it's, not, it's not too many that see that. Oh, really? I thought it looked blatantly obvious to me. Uh, but uh, again, it's, it's, but I'm asked this question a lot of times, you know, yeah. but I, I, maybe I'm already too specific here. But anyway, yeah, get your question. Sorry. Yeah, the question is, yeah, are, are you looking at getting into the DAW market full stop and competing against the likes of Logic, Ableton, uh, Cubase? You know, my, my answer to that would be what I said earlier, we want to make sure that every producer and any DJ has an environment at its fingertips that is completely seamlessly integrating. And to do that, yes, there is some more components that we need to uh, add. 
That's great that you're aware of it because I would love more stuff like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's important to um, say we are not building logic. Uh, so we are not interested in this whole, hey, we are building a DAW. What you see with Machina is basically a different way of making music and there wasn't really a way of doing that in the computer field, and that's what we did. And obviously there's gonna be a version three and a version four, and we will add more features to it. But what is really important to us is that we maintain the character of the product and don't try to turn it into something to kind of compete with some whatever market, something that they're doing already great, because that's not what we're here for. Okay, one more question. Okay, good afternoon. Um, hey. As soon as, as the time passed, I have the feeling that uh, the use of uh, software synthesizing is decreasing and people start dusting off the um, recovering the, um, the physical synthesizer, the old machines. Do you have also this, this feeling? No, I, uh, it's about the um, basically the trend of using again analog gear, oh, the right. get, pulling out the old synthesizers from your the, the back of your room. To, to be honest, um, I don't know if you want to answer that question. Um, I I totally you know you could also say vinyl is coming back. There is a lot of stores in Berlin that actually sell vinyl again more than they used to two years ago and. Um, but the truth is, at least from my point of view, it's not really coming back as being the future, as being a mass phenomena. It is just an element of culture that, you know, even I, that doesn't play vinyl since, since, since a while, thinking maybe it's time because it's just, there's some nostalgia there that I like. I like the big album art and da 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 da. So uh, honestly, also the same with the synthesizers. Um, there is just, this time where you feel you want to be special, different. Um, there is this overload of digitalization and you're just looking for other ways to express. But no, I don't think this is going to be a trend that is going to be sustainable for the next 10 years. You cannot get away from the computer and digital. There is no way. So no, we are not fearing that trend. It's totally okay. We are not supporting it. Rather is it our job to make sure that you are more excited about the synthesizers that are in the, sitting in the computer and we are working on making that uh, a reality. Um, Daniel and Marta, thank you and thank you for listening. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Guys.